on, Mr. Foxhound. The commander is waiting. That's the sickest thing I ever heard. is arguably the greatest year for video gaming ever. Some of the most influential games of all time were coming out one after another. Half-Life, Thief, The Dark Project, Resident Evil 2, Starcraft, The First Rainbow Six, Pokemon Red and Blue, Fallout 2, and the highest rated Metacritic game in existence, Ocarina of Time. As a bonus mention, Two games that everyone I knew played and loved, including myself, 1080 Snowboarding and WCW vs. NWO Revenge. It was a beautiful time, filled with steroids and Tommy Hilfiger denim. JESUS! I guess you had to be there. Suffice it to say, 98 was a peak for this art form. However, one game that has, for me, always stood above the rest is Metal Gear Solid. Well, moron, good for Happy Gilmore, oh my god! The genesis of the Metal Gear franchise finds us back in 1987. Young upstart Japanese game developer Hideo Kojima, a year into working for mega publisher Konami, was tasked with creating a military-themed combat game for the Japanese MSX2 computer. Due to the constraints of the MSX2 hardware, no more than three character sprites could be handled on screen at once, and projectiles such as bullets ate up even more of the precious memory. With these limitations, Kojima-san had to get creative with his vision. Inspired greatly by the James Bond film series, Kojima-san conceived of a game where, in place of the typical gung-ho soldier needing to blast his way out of an enemy encampment, the player would instead need to quietly infiltrate a stronghold to gain intel, rescue a hostage, or destroy a piece of equipment. And thus, the stealth game was birthed unto the world. Many of the tropes that would be pertinent in future Metal Gear titles, such as the player beginning the mission without any weapons or equipment, use of items like keycards, and a support team that would help the player via radio, were introduced here. It also gave us the first appearance of one of the most iconic video game characters of all time, Solid Snake. Drawing heavily from John Carpenter's legendary fictional hero, Snake Plissken in the film Escape from New York, Snake also wore a bandana, a la Michael from The Deer Hunter, and smoked Lucky Striker cigarettes like a man. A man with compromised alveolar function. Released on the MSX2, the sequel, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, upped every aspect of its predecessor, introducing even more gameplay variety and injecting a greater amount of the soon-to-be signature Hideo Kojima flair. Both games sold very well in Japan, and with a successful, though lesser quality, NES port of the first game, American and European gamers, too, were getting a taste of Snake. How does it taste? Following Metal Gear 1 and 2, Kojima-san went on to helm both Snatcher and Police Knots, two games heavily influenced by the film classic Blade Runner, my personal favorite, by the way. During the final phase of development for 1994's Police Knots, Kojima began to generate the concept for a third Metal Gear, initially set to release on the 3DO. When the 3DO's future appeared dim, Kojima then set his sights on the hot new 3D console of the time, the Sony PlayStation.
With this new technology at his disposal, in particular through the increased storage space of compact discs, Kojima could now greatly expand upon his desire to present his vision in a fully 3D world with extensive, fully voice-acted cinematics. The main character's code name, as well as the move to three dimensions, inspired the addition of the word solid to the title, which has been retained ever since. Kojima expanded his team to include Motosara Mori, a veteran of various Japanese military units, to add a new layer of tactical realism to both gameplay and animations. Morisan also set up mock military courses and role-playing activities within the offices at Konami Japan for the design team to acquaint them with the feeling of actual military movements. Additionally, he went on to be instrumental in integrating CQC into MGS3, but I have to strongly resist the urge to get that far ahead. Rising from the ranks of a debugger during development of Police Knots was Yoji Shinkawa, who was given charge over the mecha and character designs of Metal Gear Solid. And for as much credit as Hideo Kojima is rightly afforded for captaining the vessel, Metal Gear Solid would not have become the absolute classic that it is without Shinkawa-san. The Cyborg Ninja, an iconic character for the series, was Shinkawa-san's design a design so beloved by Hideo Kojima that he decided to rework parts of the storyline to wedge the character in. Another large contribution was in the redesign of crucial series character Hal Emmerich, aka Otacon. Initially, Otacon was set to be portrayed as a short, heavy-set tech nerd obsessed with sweets. Shinkawa-san redesigned the otaku into the version that has become known to millions of people around the globe. A skinny nerd that pees his pants. <laughs> so with a core team of only 20 people, development was underway. Initially displayed to the general public in 1996, the original version of Metal Gear Solid was a bit different than the final product, but all of the major hallmarks were present. An updated trailer was shown at E3 1997 to a massive positive response. Now, carrying the weight of global interest and plenty of hype, the team spent the remaining months polishing and refining the title until, at last, we come back around to 1998. Excellent. A glorious year for gaming, indeed. On its surface, the foundational concept of Metal Gear Solid is almost identical to that of its predecessors. You're a spy sent into enemy territory to rescue hostages and dismantle the threat of a nuclear strike. I'll be getting into some spoilerish territory, but given that many younger gamers may actually be experiencing their first playthrough soon via the Master Collection, I'll do my best to not ruin any major plot points. I know, I know, the game's 25 years old, but give the kids a break. Besides, I won't waste your time with a simple bullet point rundown of the story. It's been done. Rather, I'd like to reflect on a few of the aspects of the game that are poignant and dear to me. If you'd be so kind, please afford me this emotional response. The themes of the first Metal Gear Solid are several layers deep, naturally given the game's Japanese origins and that the creator's parents would have been alive during the nuclear strikes on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The hideous reality of nuclear proliferation has always been baked into the DNA of this series and is presented very deftly in this game. That's where he worked. I understand, but why Metal Gear? The nuclear age ended with the turn of the millennium. Oh, you're wrong. The threat of nuclear war isn't gone. In fact, it's greater than it's ever been. Snake's conversation with arms tech president Kenneth Baker presents the grim reality of nuclear technology, including materials unaccounted for, or MUF. MUF? 
Not only is the nuclear motif ever present in Metal Gear Solid, but this conversation also illuminates the military industrial complex and the thick, oily greed that comes with armed conflict from the players behind the scenes, which, much to my great sadness, continues to this day. However, I've always seen the overarching theme of the first Metal Gear Solid to be fate, specifically fate as is defined in your genetic code. I have to admit that some of the final cutscenes dealing with concepts like the selfish gene theory and the super baby method and how all of this relates to genetic destiny tends to run on a little long, but A, I love this stuff in all of its cheesy glory, and B, it serves to emphasize how far obsessed the primary antagonist, Liquid Snake, has become with his genetic destiny, especially with his misguided inferiority complex. In the end, the storyline concludes this thread with us being told that you are not simply confined to your genetic destiny, that you are not beholden to the sins of the father or the mistakes of the mother, that we are individuals with free will and can choose to live our lives. We simply must harness the will to act on this and then go. Before moving on with the story, a very special mention needs to be had for a man named Jeremy Blaustein a Long Island native that had been working in Japan as an English teacher for Japanese students before landing a gig at Konami as a translator and localizer, a man who converted Japanese characters and sentence structures into English for the Western markets. After having been responsible for localizing this historic gaming dialogue, Mankind ill needs a savior such as you. What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets! Blaustein was then hired to convert the entire Metal Gear Solid script from Japanese to English, by himself, as in alone, without help. And you have to remember, this was before the advent of lightning-fast internet and limitless digital information at one's fingertips. The guy had to do all of this research the old-fashioned way, going to the library, reading, absorbing, and repurposing a dizzying amount of military literature to learn the appropriate terminology and lingo, watching all sorts of military movies to extrapolate any valuable information, etc. And he had to make all of this happen in six months. Now, localization is not as simple as taking Japanese characters and simply rewriting them in English. The way we speak is much different to how the Japanese language is written. Not only that, but he had to make everything work in the time frame of various cutscene fades and character motions in the Japanese cutscenes that had already been assembled for the final game. I say again, he did this by himself within six months. Truly incredible work, a resounding demonstration of discipline. We all owe Jeremy Blaustein a major debt of gratitude. Slow down. Don't worry. The tale begins with Solid Snake infiltrating Shadow Moses Island after being coaxed out of retirement by his old friend and comrade, Colonel Roy Campbell. The terrorists demand $1 billion and the body of deceased legendary war hero, Big Boss. If the stipulations aren't met, they'll launch a nuclear weapon. Ah, the terrorists, yes. Former members of Special Forces Unit Foxhound. And Roy Campbell and Solid Snake and Naomi Hunter, every time I think about what I love most about Metal Gear Solid, the characters are the first thing that spring to mind. Snake is the badass hero, one-man army type, that eats bowls of nails without any milk. But there's an entire support team behind him as well as a squad of villains waiting in opposition. Writers Hideo Kojima and Tomokazu Fukushima took great care to make sure that each character had a distinct personality and a fleshed out story so that they all felt like real individuals, albeit exaggerated and fantastical. Colonel Campbell is the perfect counterpart to Solid Snake. Age hasn't slowed you down one bit. Heavily influenced by Colonel Troutman from First Blood, he's no bean counter. A Green Beret himself with combat experience, Campbell is well familiar with Snake, his history, and his capabilities. He also has his own deeply personal agenda and quite a bit riding on this operation. 
Thus, he depends on Snake to succeed, but has to obfuscate certain details and flatly play dumb to try and maintain operational control. He's not some cigar-chomping, dumb-dumb, get-some-hua-type leader. He's a complex, conflicted, and morally gray character that ultimately needs to ensure success of the mission, first and foremost. Finding out why, as we run a gamut of emotions with him, is a satisfying course of the greater story. What? What are you talking about? Master Miller, one of Snake's old military instructors and survival expert, is also part of the support team. Again, like Campbell, it appears at first glance that he may just be another tight-ass military cliche, ready to call you a maggot and make you drop down and give him 50, blah blah blah, but oh, oh no. He's a very fascinating character with some very familiar cheekbones, but we'll leave it at that. If you know, you know. Gotta find you. Thankfully, it's not all gruff dudes with buff chests. The female characters are, especially for the time, major standouts. These ladies can hold their own and really have quite a large role in the Solid series overall, such as with Dr. Naomi Hunter. Dr. Hunter, assuming that is your name. Seriously, Snake? Though initially presented as a highly intelligent and well-respected geneticist with a bit of a flirtatious penchant, to say that her character's arc becomes complicated is an understatement. Naomi ends up playing a fundamental role not only in this game, but in the fourth solid title and in the conclusion of Snake as a character overall. And this actually begins in the briefing, a completely optional bit of story content found on the main menu, in which Colonel Campbell persuades Snake to take this very mission. What was that injection for? It's a combination of nanomachines and an anti-freezing peptide so that your blood and other bodily fluids don't freeze, even at sub -octic Naomi is seen giving Snake a routine pre-mission inoculation, though it turns out that the effects of this shot were going to have much, much greater implications in the narrative. Not to mention her familial ties. Hurt me more! Who are you? Then we have Meryl Silverberg, a soldier with Foxhound and niece of Colonel Roy Campbell. Meryl was sent to Shadow Moses as a replacement for missing troops. It turns out that her being sent to the base was not a mere coincidence, but I'll keep it there. She refused to participate in the rebellion as the villains within Foxhound took over the island, so she was imprisoned. Can you shoot me, rookie? Careful, I'm no rookie. Liar. That nervous glance, that scared look in your eyes, they're rookies' eyes if I ever saw them. Meryl's character development in Metal Gear Solid is one of my favorites in all of gaming. She starts out as this brash, though obviously frightened, 18-year-old kid wanting to pursue what she thought would be this glorious, illustrious career as a soldier under the command of Foxhound, her Uncle Campbell's old unit, as well as her deceased father's. In order to feel closer to her departed father, as well as in an attempt to understand him better, Meryl pursued this dream, and upon finally getting to the front line and being in combat, Meryl freezes up and hastens to pull the trigger, forcing Snake to shoot the enemies down to save both of their lives. She then kicks into action and battles alongside him. On an adrenaline high, and perhaps influenced by something else, she flees Snake's position and appears as though she's full of machismo. As we find out later, the glory and glamour of combat is not what it seemed in her imagination. The reality of killing another human being in battle is grisly, ugly, and the consequences stay with you forever. So are you a soldier yet? I thought I was until today, but now I understand. The truth is, I was just afraid of looking at myself, afraid of having to make my own decisions in life. But I'm not gonna lie to myself anymore. It's time I took a long, hard look at myself. I want to know who I am, what I'm capable of. I want to know why I've lived the way I've lived until now. I want to know. Take a good look. You won't get another chance for a while. You should wash your face, too, while you're at it. Yeah. It's really a credit to Debbie Mae West's performance as Meryl that a teenaged me 
all about the macho boy shit, really shut up and listened to this character as she laid her feelings bare. Meryl does serve as Snake's eventual love interest, which always made the sequel, Metal Gear Solid 2, sting for me, as she's not present at all, save for a passing reference in a sort of hidden Kodak call. As a result, her eventual return in Metal Gear Solid 4 was bittersweet for many reasons. The frayed romance with old Snake was brilliant, but again, I need to stay in 1998. Snake. What can we say? His basic characterization is, as previously described, the prototypical manly man. Gritty, jacked, cigarette smoking. A tough guy that, on the surface, isn't much different than a typical Arnie character from the 80s. Putting aside the immense undersurface plot about his origin and extended family that acts as the big endgame reveal, the subtle touches of the Solid Snake character have always been more interesting to me. But Snake, you're a hero, aren't you? I'm just a man who's good at what he does, killing. There's no winning or losing for a mercenary. The only winners in war are the people. That's right, and you fight for the people. I've never fought for anyone but myself. I've got no purpose in life, no ultimate goal. Snake has a rough exterior but it's clear that he's really an angry, lonely man. His rigid outward disposition is readably covering a lifetime of trauma and is likely a defense to protect anyone else from getting mired in his grief. He wants to suffer solitarily, and it's not cliche in that he's secretly desperate for company. I genuinely believe that the character wishes to be alone and is more comfortable mushing dogs in Alaska than living amongst the squares in general society. I hear that. God, do I ever hear that. But there are more layers. The moments when the man, David, not codenamed Solid Snake, come out. It's impactful because he doesn't typically let his guard down. When Gray Fox, his close friend, runs off to certain death, you can hear the emotion in his voice, and it hurts. I'll stop it from moving! Fox! When Meryl is in danger, we can feel the desperation of Snake. The writing, acting, and music cause a swell of sadness, anger, and hopelessness. But then Snake's training and experience kick in, and he needs to get back to work. He stifles his worry and gets aggressive. It's all a part of what makes the character of Solid Snake so beloved and endearing. He's a durable, switched-on soldier with a no-nonsense body count, but is written with multiple dimensions, and as the player, we're right there for all of it. It's what makes video games the ultimate medium. Some characters have substantial arcs that span multiple iterations, right up until the conclusion of this franchise. Even some of the seemingly minor characters in the first game were added into the continuity of the storyline later that made them major players down the line. I could make an entire video on the characters of the first Metal Gear Solid alone, but in summary, the personas in this game are incredibly well written, even when they're goofy and over the top, perhaps even more so at that point. They're all memorable, unique, and contribute something meaningful to the story and the gameplay. The character designs are incredible, distinctive, and lovingly crafted. A heavily muscled shaman wielding a minigun, a burn victim psychic with a gas mask, even a character like Decoy Octopus, who many don't remember because he doesn't have any lines in the game. Or does he? Really? None of these characters would be as memorable as they are, however, without the phenomenal vocal performances to flesh them out. Okay guys, if you think I've been positive about Metal Gear Solid up to this point, strap in. It's gonna be a long one. As good as gaming was in 1998, it was mostly the growth of gameplay concepts and rapidly evolving graphics technology that had us hooked. It wasn't the acting. Jesus Christ, it wasn't the acting. Stop it! Don't open that door! But Chris is... To protect the life cycle. Oh, that's not pro! 
problem with my safe work system. No accident should have occurred. Oh! I have made a creature to rule over mankind. What is it? Maybe it's Chris. Then, Chris Zimmerman came along and brought some friends. Don't lie to me! Metal Gear Solid changed everything. No, I'm serious. This game marked a turning point, an early example of video games being taken more seriously as a storytelling agency. With a combination of copious amounts of dialogue and limited graphics technology, one thing the game had to nail down to sell the premise was the voice acting. One woman who never gets enough credit in the round table when the legacy of Metal Gear Solid is being discussed is Chris Zimmerman Salter. Hideo Kojima created Metal Gear, but Chris Zimmerman is the reason we in Western society all love it. Ms. Zimmerman Salter is a voice director that began her career as a talent coordinator in the halls of Hanna-Barbera. In the 90s, she was hired as the voice director for an upcoming video game, Metal Gear Solid. Upon having read the script, which she's described as having been a foot thick, she recommended a list of 20 actors that she felt could bring these elaborate, colorful characters to life. 19 of the 20 went on to earn parts in the game. The story of the recording of Metal Gear Solid is very charming. As opposed to recording the dialogue in an elaborate professional studio, the recordings were performed inside of the Hollywood home of legendary silent film actor, Rudolph Valentino. Actors would park around back and simply walk through the kitchen and down the hall to reach the studio. On breaks, the actors would get their lunch out of the fridge and mellow out a while. In the studio, actors would perform on a lower level, often together with each other like a play. There was a television for the performers to reference character movement if need be. The upper, tiered levels of the room were a grouping of tables with recording equipment on them, manned by eight staff members, including Chris Zimmerman. Christopher Randolph, the voice of Otacon, describes this small audience as giving the sessions a performance tension, akin to being on stage. According to Zimmerman, the room wasn't soundproofed, not even the glass between the staff and the actors, so every noise was picked up on mic. The house sat on a corner with a stop sign, meaning that every truck, motorcycle, ambulance, and barking dog would halt the take in progress, and the actors had to start over. According to Paul Eiting, the voice of Colonel Campbell, this was especially disruptive on trash pickup days. Another aspect that I found interesting was that if an actor wished to alter a word of dialogue or how the line was delivered, Ms. Zimmerman had to call the brass at Konami Japan to seek approval. David Hayter, the voice of Snake, said that everyone would wait for approximately 15 minutes for this process, only to then be told, no. I found the tales of recording the original Metal Gear Solid to be so enchanting. It has a real grassroots feeling to it, just a bunch of hungry young actors and a talented, confident, driven voice director that wanted to bring out the best in each other, despite not being fully aware of the success that this project was going to bring them. These characters are phenomenal. Otacon was portrayed by Christopher Randolph, who initially came in to read for the part of Solid Snake. After that was unsuccessful, Chris Zimmerman brought him another few pages of dialogue and a picture of Otacon. As Christopher describes, the character was basically just himself with longer hair. The audition was a winner, and anyone that listens to Mr. Randolph talk can hear the otaku coming through. You know me? Randolph deserves a lot of credit for going to emotional places with his character that are fairly uncommon for gaming, especially for its day. Why? Why? I loved you. Ah. Ha. Right. Touch that wire and the C4 will blow up along with the old man. Patrick Lane Zimmerman voices Revolver Ocelot and went on to do so for the sequel, as well as the Titanic fourth game. Ocelot is arguably the most important character in the entire series. But that's a whole video in its own right. 
Zimmerman brings plenty of his Shakespearean history to this character, which gives Ocelot a great deal of theatricality, which is appropriate given that he's a Russian expat in a special forces unit wearing cowboy garb and twirling a wheel gun. If only we knew how ridiculous it would get from there. I tell you, he loved every second of it. <laughs> Peter Lurie voiced the one and only Vulcan Raven. Peter played Raven with a mix of mystic shaman and blood-soaked barbarian. His performance is a perfect blend of hammy and grounded, and the laugh you just heard is actually relevant, as Peter did ADR for Brandon Lee in The Crow after Brandon was tragically killed in an onset accident. <laughs> <laughs> After which, the laughing kind of became his gimmick, and thus it was brought to Vulcan Raven as well. Notably, Peter's father, Alan Lurie, was the voice of Arms Tech President Kenneth Baker, another stellar performance. Sadly, Alan passed away in March of 2015. It can't rain all the time. Colonel, can you hear me? Loud and clear. What's the situation, Snake? One of my favorite characters in the game is Colonel Roy Campbell, voiced by Paul Eiding. Paul is a living legend, without question. The man has nearly 300 acting credits to his name. As a Metal Gear junkie, I always love hearing his familiar glottal inflections over various games. You've likely heard his voice in multiple video games and movies and didn't even realize it. Good morning, vault calling. But this performance as Campbell in Metal Gear Solid will always be the crown jewel for me. Paul was a sergeant in the U.S. Army's 3rd Infantry Division, and thus, he has a better understanding of what genuine military men often sound like. It's distinct from his counterparts in the genre, who all do that generic, over-the-top, rah-rah bullshit that nobody but the biggest dorks actually sound like in the service. Campbell is an old pro, seasoned and weathered. Mr. Eiding does an excellent job of portraying the stoic hard man that gets caught off guard when he becomes trapped in a lie. The voice, in combination with subtle facial animations in Kodak calls during these revelatory moments, really helps bring to life this man that has a mission to accomplish but is also barely hiding his personal agenda and it's never maudlin or over the top. Though you never directly interact with the good colonel, you really get the sense that this guy is the real deal. At least in the first game. I'm not home right now. Please leave a message after the beep. Beep! Oof, those idiots! All right, Raven. I'll be right there. Speaking of over the top, Cam Clark's portrayal of Liquid Snake the game's primary antagonist is as hammy and classically villainous as it gets. I don't mean that as an insult. I love Liquid Snake dearly. I want a tattoo of Liquid Sunglasses somewhere. Cam Clark, another prolific voice actor with a long list of credits to his name, is just wonderful as the classic British bad guy that stops just shy of twirling a cane and twisting his mustache. He seems to really love doing the character and his enthusiasm for the project comes through at every turn. Liquid here. What is all this I hear about this, this Florida man? This new villain? <laughs> he thinks he can steal my crown of infamy and villainy? It's not easy to make long, long scenes of dialogue sound interesting, but the guy does it. And all fun aside, there are some moments when he genuinely sounds in despair as he gets across why he has such hatred for his genetic destiny, as well as being truly despicable when he steps on a certain character. I love it so much. But of course, he's not the only snake. Don't lie to me! David Hayter, the man himself, 
the voice of the ubiquitous Solid Snake. As mentioned earlier, Snake is a character that outwardly prefers the life of solitude, which Hater perfectly captures in his rough, coarse tone. As Hater describes it, his initial audition was closer to his real voice. When he read that the character was already retired from special forces and had been through many battles, he added a tired, resentful gravel to his voice, and thus the legendary pipes produced gold. Also, his face was modeled on Christopher Walken, which, in an alternate dimension, would have been the ultimate casting. Why are you calling me brother? Who the hell are you? This is bad. Anyway, I suck. The primary reason I love his voice in the first Metal Gear Solid, in particular, is because the deep, gruff inflection, as cool and manly as it is, will occasionally break, and the tough guy veil slips a little bit. It's in those small moments where Solid Snake's concern and desperation comes out, as when he realizes Meryl has frozen in combat. What are you waiting for? Shoot! Don't talk to me like a rookie! I'm telling you, shoot! I had mentioned the bonus briefing section in the main menu. If you want a distilled version of the excellent acting and character play between Paul Eiding as Campbell and David Hayter as Snake, this is a fantastic resource. You can really hear these guys having a blast playing off of one another, and it's a nice premium for fans of the story. There's more I'd like to comment on as far as the voice acting for Metal Gear Solid is concerned, but I'm going to save that for the next video, for comparison's sake. Sound effects are absolutely iconic. Weapon effects get the job done, from the automatic thunder of the FAMAS to the calming, cheery sprinkling of the chaff grenade. The more important effects are, of course, the iconic codec call alert sound, the alert noise when spotted by the enemy, and the sound of Snake's life meter as it's being drained. In particular, the alert noise has become so integrated into the sort of tech nerd gamer media culture that videos being made to this day utilize this sound effect, and I'm not even sure if the creators themselves know of the origin. <laughs> the effect was created on the Roland JV-1080, along with the Mantis Hymn, a song that I used to study neuroanatomy with, since it helped me focus, ironically. There had been some incredible gaming soundtracks by the time Metal Gear Solid had come around. I very clearly remember playing Super Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins, on my little red Game Boy, just to listen to the music. Then you have games like Final Fantasy VI, Doom, Quake 2, and so on. Even at the time when the voice acting in games suck, musicians have always been able to really express themselves creatively through gaming. But there was always something different about Metal Gear Solid. This was something much more cinematic. There was a true sense of thematic cohesion, with a similar theme running throughout the entire game, only altered to emphasize or reflect the emotion of the scene you were in. Be it sneaking through the tank hangar, or challenging a walking nuclear mech. <sighs> with that said, after 25 years of playing and loving Metal Gear Solid, it weighs heavily on my fanboy heart to write this next section. Alright, so during my research about the game's soundtrack for this script, it's shocking how much um, inspiration the game's composers took from other music. Now look, all artists get inspired by other artists. There's nothing wrong with hearing really great music and being encouraged to write an inspired track in a similar vein. One of progressive rock's most accomplished bands, Dream Theater, kept a mantle of CDs that Mike Portnoy referred to as the inspiration corner when recording scenes from a memory. Nobody expects a composer to sit in a black, silent room and create musical magic from absolutely nothing. I just mentioned Doom. That game is well known to have basically ripped off many major rock and metal tracks, like Master of Puppets and Mouth for War. I still love the soundtrack to Doom. That said, Let's talk about Metal Gear Solid's supposed plagiarism. Credited to Tappy Iwase, 
The main theme of Metal Gear Solid is one of the most beautiful compositions in gaming history. Harry Gregson Williams' remix for Metal Gear Solid 2 was even better, injecting Gregson Williams' signature digital techno beats and thundering drums alongside the stirring string arrangements. However, as it turns out, old mate Tappy may or may not have purloined the tune from neo-romantic Soviet composer Georgi Sviridov. Sviridov composed the soundtrack for the 1964 Soviet film, The Blizzard, or Mithil, also translated as The Snowstorm. More specifically, the song Winter Road. Due to copyright issues, I haven't included the songs in this video, but I did link them in the description so that you may judge for yourself. If you're rolling your eyes and getting defensive, ready to load up Reddit right this second, trust me, I was too when I heard these allegations many years ago, and was reminded of them again while writing this script. The difference is, I decided to listen this time, and, well, uh, there's a reason the saying, don't meet your heroes, exists. In a 2008 interview with Electronic Gaming Monthly, one of the series' composers, Norihiko Hibino, flat out refutes that the main theme was lifted but states that it was left out of Metal Gear Solid 4, new at that time, because Konami was, quote, too sensitive about the potential legal situation surrounding Sviridov's work. Hibino denies it, but in this clip, you can see representatives from Mr. Sviridov's camp presenting Hideo Kojima with the original piece of music that they allege had been lifted. I'm not an expert in decoding micro-expressions, and perhaps it's just Kojima's shy, boyish charm. But that face has, uh-oh, written all over it. <laughs> there was also a song from the 1994 film, Speed, that I've linked below. And knowing Hideo Kojima's massive, throbbing priapism for Hollywood, it really wouldn't surprise me if the influence slipped its way in. I digress. I'm a Metal Gear fanboy for life. <laughs> and I still adore the soundtrack to this game. I don't want to color the whole thing as if it's all been lifted. Many of the original tracks are burned into my soul. They've made me weep. They've given me hope during dark times in my life. Play them at my funeral, like... The ending cinematics with Rika Miranaka's gorgeous song, The Best Is Yet To Come, is something I used to listen to in its entirety every time I beat the game. This was before Spotify and YouTube, etc., so I used to really savor this moment dearly. Make no mistake, Metal Gear Solid's soundtrack and overall audio design is an absolute triumph. This will be even more relevant when we discuss the audio and the goddamn twin snakes. Here, it's a little turtle. So, the voice acting is phenomenal, the music is great, but these facets of gaming don't really age. Sure, audio recording techniques and clarity have evolved, allowing some nicer timbre for audio files, but all in all, the soundscape is mostly timeless. The visuals, however, might be a bit of a barrier of entry for some. I won't try to convince you that this is comparable to Red Dead 2 or anything, but allow me to defend the dated visuals a little bit. Firstly, when this game came out, the graphics were incredible. It's impossible to understand if you weren't there, but in 1998, this game was the closest approximation to a film that we had. The cinematic camera angles when pressed against cover, the sweeping shots during cutscenes, even the subtle facial expression changes during codec calls. Here's the thing. A lot of the dialogue in this game is delivered through codec calls. Again, because the script and the acting are excellent, these conversations are quite enjoyable. However, the little animations for characters' various emotional responses really help to sell what are, essentially, two talking green pictures in a box. Just a box. The graphics have clearly aged. A lot. Metal Gear Solid makes a very, very good argument for aesthetics over polygon counts. 
There are those rare, beautiful games that combine the two, like The Witcher 3 and Grand Theft Auto 4, but I will always play a game with high style and a distinct creative art direction over a bland but realistic looking game. It's the same reason I will always love GoldenEye 007. Nowadays, especially on an N64, the game looks pretty awful, but every level, weapon, and character is colorful and memorable and will live in the happy corner of my mind forevermore. Same for Metal Gear Solid. I am obsessed with the PlayStation's 32-bit pixelated dithered graphics. The visuals are far from realistic, but I play video games to have a short break from realistic. Plus, it has the Johnny Poo Poo running animation. Smell. I've mentioned this several times in past videos, but I love the stealth action genre video games so much. Escape from Butcher Bay, Tenchu, Manhunt, Dishonored, Thief, and of course, my beloved Splinter Cell. My love affair with the genre started with Metal Gear Solid. The idea of infiltrating an area rife with heavily armed enemies and environmental hazards, slipping by unnoticed, doing a job and leaving without a trace is a thrill. That said, as the years have gone by and the stealth elements in gaming have been honed to such a fine point, every time I go back to the first Metal Gear Solid, it definitely shows its age and really the stealth elements are the weakest part of the gameplay. I know, I know, sacrilege. Look, I have to be fair and scrutinize the weaker elements of this game honestly. And before anyone cries lack of skill, I'm not saying the game is too hard or unfair. It's just rough around the edges. Even by Metal Gear Solid 2, only three years later, the gameplay had been polished up significantly and the sneaking was silky smooth. Now, stealth in Metal Gear Solid isn't bad, and I still get such a rush stacking up behind a wall and waiting for just the right moment to slip by unnoticed. But there are some issues that did just flat out annoy me. I know the enemy troopers are genome soldiers and all interconnected through nanomachines and yada yada yada, but when one soldier sees you, everyone on the board instantaneously knows and they come running. At least they're kind of dumb and Snake can slip away pretty easily. It's also a nice touch that the alert and evasion phase are pretty quick. For as much as I love Snake Eater, it's probably my favorite game ever made. The caution phase after detection is so slow. Anyway, the team obviously realized this issue and in the sequel, Sons of Liberty, Snake can disable enemy radios, or you know, enemies, before they can call out to their comrades and sound the alarm. Using sound distractions and having enemies notice things like Snake's footprints in the snow are still impressive and fun to play with, but really, the stealth action gameplay despite being the hook of Metal Gear Solid, is not why I keep playing this old bastard. I come back year after year because I absolutely think the world of the set pieces, quirky moments, and the boss battles. Now, before detailing a few gameplay highlights, I should mention that Metal Gear Solid recycles a lot of the concepts from the Japanese-only release, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, released in 1990. This isn't a knock on Metal Gear Solid at all though. Very few, if any people in the West, would have played Metal Gear 2, and the game wasn't technically manumitted to us until its inclusion in the expanded Snake Eater re-release known as Subsistence in 2005. Gameplay elements such as a secret admirer giving us clues, a key needing to be frozen or warmed, even the secret radio frequency hidden on the back of the actual game box, these were directly ported from Metal Gear 2. It was worth mentioning here, but again, especially in 1998, 
Metal Gear Solid was all new and mind-blowing for a kid like me. I imagine it was for you too. The levels are packed with cool little moments, like this one here in the armory. Snake is trying to locate Kenneth Baker, a hostage. We know he's here, but he's not in any of the storage rooms that we can access. I remember so vividly being stumped as a kid, but after a few Kodak calls, I was told to look for walls painted a different color, and that because it would be hollow behind the plastered up wall, that they might emit a different sound as well. So I went knocking around the walls until... Holy shit. This was before we had the internet in our home. It's called the internet, and it's a fresh new way to check out sites, buy clothing, and surf music. And it's all located on this tiny CD-ROM. Way before YouTube walkthroughs and all of that. Figuring stuff like this out was extremely rewarding, especially as a little kid. I hadn't played any of the Zelda games at this point in my life, so solving these little mini dungeons was brand new to me, and truly a thrill. The little fourth wall breaking gameplay elements were unbelievable. In this section, Snake has to get Meryl's codec frequency from Kenneth Baker to progress in the game. Baker forgets the number, and thus, Snake is stuck. Then he says this. Where's she at? Oh yeah. Let me tell you, it's... Oh. oh. Sorry. I forgot. Damn! Oh, that's right. It should be on the back of the CD case. Try to contact her. I'll con back of the CD case? Well, he did just give us an optical disc, and it's in Snake's inventory. I could not, for the life of me, figure out how to use this object to call Meryl. How does it, um, how does it work? I swear to any god of your choice that this is absolutely true. Eventually, I took a break to go make a poop, and I brought the case of the game with me to read. This was before smartphones, kids. It was either that or a bottle of pert. Gay! As I sat there shifting my bowels, I noticed a picture of a codex screen on the back of the case with a female face on the left, her frequency prominently displayed. I could not believe what I was seeing. You gotta be kidding me. Get out! The game had told me to check the actual, physical, real-world video game case to find out how to call Meryl. To this day, I laugh at the audacity and the clever nature of this gameplay quirk. Oh, and if you wondered, it was a clean finish. <sighs> Hell yeah, dude. I've always enjoyed the little creative bits of level interaction as well. In the introductory spot of the blast furnace, Snake needs to avoid this large smelting crane as he slinks along a narrow ledge above a pool of molten sludge. You can crouch and carry on when it passes, or you could simply shoot a missile into it, breaking it down permanently, which allowed you to just creep on by. It's very stealthy. I remember an interview with a member of the Metal Gear Solid 4 team in which he said that they wanted the player of the game to be able to think up nearly any gameplay idiosyncrasy and be excited when they realized that the team had implemented it. This feels like the prototype to that sentiment. Then there are more peculiar mechanics that I still remember being baffled to discover years later once we did have internet access. In this section, Snake has to meet up with Meryl on the other side of a wolf dog lair. The pups are hostile towards Snake and will attack on sight. However, and what I'm about to say is 100% true, if you sorta beat up Meryl and then quickly equip a cardboard box, she'll command a dog to micturate on the box. What are you doing? Now it smells like puppy piss, and when you trek back through the lair with this box on, the dogs will love you. One last bit I'd like to mention is the cell that Snake is held in after being tortured. After some story beats, including Naomi vibrating your controller to make your arm feel better, no, really, it's time to break out. 
This segment is memorable because of the options given to the player. The guard has to make a dookie, which became a running theme of the series going forward. Yes, the character's IBS was explained in depth and used as a plot point. Oh, what a smell. Anyway, on track. When the guard runs off to make caca, Snake can lay on the ground and disperse ketchup around him to appear dead. When the guard returns, he opens the cell to investigate. But if you screw up, you gotta figure something else out. When his angry butthole attacks again, Snake can sneak under the bed like a game of hide and seek. Which is kinda silly, but if all else fails, a friend of yours will eventually come to break you out. This is such a perfect little slice of Metal Gear Solid gameplay design, giving the player options to conquer most scenarios. The brainstorming sessions in those Konami offices with the intimate 20-person team feverishly pitching ideas and frantically smoking as the concepts flowed must have been some sight. Speaking of which, the boss fights of Metal Gear Solid have always been held in very high regard, and with good reason. They're fucking awesome. Draw! Though it's simple, I've always enjoyed the Revolver Ocelot fight. The goofy ricochet bullets from the original 45 Colt, Ocelot beaming with exhilaration as he reloads mid-fight, the constant groaning from Baker tied up like a fly in a debt cord web. It's very straightforward, run and shoot, and lacks any of the puzzle solving of the follow-on bosses, but it's a classic, and a great introduction to the excellent, outlandish enemy boss designs to come. Not to mention, there's an incident post-fight that sets up a chain of completely ridiculous events in subsequent games. The Vulcan Raven fights require a bit more strategy. The first fight against a tank being piloted by Raven is not terribly complicated, but landing a grenade in the lap of a gunner is always satisfying. The second Raven fight, however, is one of the greatest in all of gaming. This fight is memorable because it reinforces the cat and mouse gameplay mechanics that, at this point in the game, you'll have become much more familiar with. We also find out where his codename comes from, as he's lugging around an M61 Vulcan Gatling cannon. Needless to say, standing in front of this thing isn't wise, and it forces the player to get creative. When Raven takes enough damage, he begins to sprint around the board looking for you. The sound of this massive man trudging, panting, and screaming in frustration winds the string even tighter. Also, the little details of Metal Gear crept in as I was capturing this footage, as my rations froze from being in this cold environment for too long. Anyway, I love Raven's final speech to Snake, in which he tells him that he will continue to walk on a path of destruction forever, that his torment will never end. I always think back to this during the final graveyard scene in Metal Gear 4, and how Raven was basically right. You shall have no peace. The battle against the Hind D helicopter is legendary. I always love playing it. Pretty simple. Why are you calling me brother? Who the hell are you? The first sniper wolf fight is tense, but pretty straightforward. Shoot her more times than she shoots you. But there is a sense of urgency as Meryl is in danger, and you feel like you still may have a chance if you work fast enough. Also, you have no idea how badly I wanted to say Meryl was in peril. The second battle with Wolf is one of my favorites in the game. The fight is essentially the same as the first, sniper vs sniper, but the setting is amazing. The snowy field shrouded in a blanket of pitch black sky tracking Sniper Wolf as she darts from hide to hide. But really, the post-fight scene is what sells this battle. The thrill of your victory is quickly curbed by a mortally wounded wolf describing her terrible childhood as a Kurd being hunted by Iraqis, followed by Otacon mourning her life coming to an end before Snake grants her one last request. It's one of the greatest scenes in the whole of Metal Gear Solid. 
And given that Otacon was in love with Wolf, there's also a clever bit of storytelling here. As Wolf reaches out towards Otacon, the camera pans down and frames her rifle as well. She wants her rifle by her side, and Otacon is just a means to retrieve it. Wolf just basically humored his boyish crush in the time that they knew each other. In the end, Otacon pined for this woman who wasn't even interested in him, and I always thought that this realization hurt him just as much as her demise did. This is then reflected in Metal Gear Solid 2 when a certain character cries out desperately for Hal's attention, and he pushes her away. Hal, I miss you. Whew, at this point in the video, I must beg your pardon. It's pretty obvious that I could talk about each facet of this game for a long time. For the sake of brevity and out of respect for your time, I'll speed it up here. Yeah, Skip a bit, just... brother. The battle against Metal Gear Rex in the hangar is extraordinary and monumental. The feeling of being this vulnerable, small creature against an indestructible colossus is phenomenal. The classic David and Goliath archetype. Rex's missile spam has always been really annoying, not to mention the odd dick laser weapon, but goddamn is this battle epic. And of course, that tragic cutscene. You know the one. The hand-to-hand -hand fight against the ninja. Ah, I love the theme that pugilism is the purest and most honorable form of combat, and I know you can use a chaff to get a quick burst of gunfire off, but you just kinda run around and punch the guy. Learning the ninja's identity really adds pathos, however, not to mention the creepy cutscene before the battle begins. It's still etched into my memory vividly. No doubt about it. Similarly, the barehanded battle against Liquid atop Rex is kinda crappy. The concept is amazing and lofty, literally, but the limited melee mechanics and Liquid's attacks doing double your damage is pretty corny. <laughs> the jeep chase segment afterwards is great though. Classic action movie type stuff. And finally, the most memorable fight of them all, Psycho Mantis. To this day, Whenever there is any kind of top 10 gaming boss list or video, Psycho Mantis almost always makes the cut. Of course, most people are aware of the clever fourth wall breaking moments that preempt the fight, such as Mantis reading your memory card or making your controller vibrate on the floor, etc., as well as the trick to break his mind control, allowing you to use your guns again. But really, the fight is pretty simple otherwise. You avoid most of his attacks by lying prone and then you chip away at him. The cutscene after the fight, however, is brilliant. And Doug Stone's performance as Mantis is one of my favorites in the history of gaming. Along with this guy. <laughs> Mantis explaining his hatred for the human race and their singular desire to pass on their genetics after detailing his traumatic childhood could have come off as really cheesy and lame but Doug Stone nails the dialogue with a palpable mix of apathy and psychopathy. He was one of the few performers that maintained this level of quality into the remake. But that's for another time. Oh, gross. You might have noticed something as I detailed these boss fights. I surely do love playing them, make no mistake. But it's really more of the story surrounding the encounters that I cherish and champion the most. Other than the second Raven fight, most bosses are really quite simple and straightforward, especially after all these years of replaying them over and over. It's really the characterization that gives the game legs. And this leads me to my ultimate point about Metal Gear Solid. Hungry for worms? No, hungry for words! <laughs> <laughs> Shut up.
If you strip away all the cutscenes, dialogue, and story beats, Metal Gear Solid as a pure gameplay experience can be finished in about three hours. I even remember when people referred to Metal Gear as the ultimate rental. This gets brought up in the discussion whenever someone opines that this game is overrated, because it's quote, all cutscenes. To be fair, you do spend more time with the story than with the actual gameplay. But really, what is a video game? Is it purely an exercise in reflexes? Pressing buttons and completing tasks? Well, for many years, with rare exceptions, that kind of was the case. Even just a year prior, in 1997, GoldenEye 007 was played by millions of us. Hours and hours and hours, huddled around a glowing television, playing Slapper's Only Deathmatch well into the night. We didn't care about the character development. It was just fun to play. And ultimately, that's debatably what's most important. Even in 1998 with Half-Life, Yes, okay, fans have speculated on the story and who the G-Man really is and all that, but throughout the actual game itself, the story was pretty scarce, with gameplay being at the forefront, and it was brilliant. I'm not arguing that a video game needs to have extensive lore or prolonged cutscenes to be considered a complete experience, but what I am saying is that when Metal Gear Solid came along, it changed video games forever. It showed us that you could integrate a mature, complex story with unique, well-written characters voiced by incredibly talented individuals. And as much as I enjoy the pure gameplay in this title, these factors are inseparable from Metal Gear Solid overall. Some people argue that by the time Metal Gear Solid 4 came along, Kojima had gone way off the rails with the amount of cutscenes and dialogue. And fair enough, Kojima did go off leash and become a little self-indulgent. But the thing is, that's what Metal Gear is to me. I don't replay this game every year because I'm really looking forward to freezing and warming the fucking pal key again. I play it because I love listening to Cam Clark ham it up as Liquid Snake. Because I love hearing Greg Eagle's heartfelt performance about soldiers of this world being tools for the government. And because of Johnny's IBS jog. <laughs> conclusion, Metal Gear Solid can be thought of as sort of a rough draft for some of the amazing gameplay concepts that would be fleshed out in future sequels, especially by the time Snake Eater rolled around in 2004. So as a traditional gameplay escapade, it may be kind of limited. But as an adventure, as an experience, it's one of the greatest video games ever made. Happy 25th anniversary, Snake. Snake? Don't touch it!